Good morning, Pathway Church. I'm glad you joined us to worship online today. This starts a new winter series called Kingdom People, Living in the Tensions of the Already Not Yet, where we discover from especially the New Testament, especially Matthew, what it means to live in the kingdom and reign of God today. I want to remind you and encourage you. I'm so excited. Next week, we start back in-person worship gatherings, January 17th at 9 and 10.30 a.m. We'll have the ability to, to distance within the room, and we'll also have kids' ministry at 10.30. So I just want to encourage you to come and celebrate together if you're feeling safe enough to do so next Sunday. 
you can click the connect button below this video and share information if we haven't um, connected with you yet or if you'd like to get on our Tuesday informational email and you can also find the giving button on the website or give through text or a gift through mail. And now I just would like to encourage you and invite you to sing and worship God together.
whisper inside that won't let you forget. Hello, my name is D.P. I know you recognize me.
morning. This morning we begin a new series, Kingdom People, living in the tension of the already, not yet. Now the series is going to look mostly at Jesus' words, the parables he taught about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Many of those are found in Matthew's gospel. But this morning, we're going to sort of introduce the topic and, and lay a groundwork for what it means to live in the already, not yet. First of all, that phrase, already, not yet, it's a contradiction, or at least it seems to be. How can something already be or have already happened if it is also not yet a reality? Well, let me try to explain. I just so happen to have a built-in illustration of this very idea, being pregnant with our first child. I am 35 weeks into this beautifully challenging process. I feel like I've been pregnant my entire life. <laughs> but I still remember those, those first moments when we found out that we were going to have a baby. There's so much excitement and expectation and emotion wrapped up in that moment and in the weeks that follow that of pregnancy. In many ways, I've already stepped into motherhood. I recognize that this baby is completely dependent on me. And so being pregnant means I eat differently. There's some things that I've been avoiding. Now I know I'm speaking mostly to an audience in Indiana, but I miss sushi. There's some foods that I'm avoiding. There's some things that I've intentionally added. There's a few things that I can't do that I used to love to do, like play flag football or run at this point without looking entirely awkward. <laughs> I'm reading books about parenthood, trying to prepare myself to the, the best way I can. I'm making all these decisions on behalf of this little life that continues to grow inside of me because I'm her mom. And yet those of you who are parents know I don't have a clue yet what it means to really be a parent, to really have a little person depend completely on me. I am a mom already, but I've not yet stepped into the full realization of motherhood. Here's how this relates to the nation of Israel. Now, Israel was God's chosen people under the first covenant. And the expectation of the Jewish people was that the long-awaited Messiah would come and he would immediately fulfill all the prophecies that they had been hearing for centuries. So when Jesus arrived on the scene, they expected to move from the not yet of all that expectation of all the, the waiting into the already of enjoying those divine promises. They expected a warrior king who would overthrow the rulers of the day and finally make them a great nation again. What they did not expect was a Messiah who would inaugurate his kingdom while waiting to fully establish it, leaving his people in the gap between partial and complete fulfillment of prophecy. Now we just celebrated and remembered that partial fulfillment in the Advent and Christmas season. We reflected on Jesus' birth, on his incarnation, on God made flesh. At the same time, we were looking ahead, we are anticipating in the Advent season, the second coming, the complete fulfillment of prophecy. And we live currently between the two, between Jesus' first and second coming. Christ's first coming was the beginning of the last days, and his second coming will be the end of the last days. He came first to usher in his kingdom, to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, and he did that. But you and I both know that this earth, this world that we live in, does not yet resemble the perfect kingdom of God. The perfect will of God is, is not here yet. Jesus promised his disciples that he would come back. And yet here we are, 
some 2,000 years later, still waiting. We live in this overlapping of the ages, in the time between Jesus' first and second coming. And so there are two timelines sort of running parallel right now, this age and the age to come. And the two timelines create a gap. They're running simultaneously, and the gap between them is the already, not yet. Pastor Jason Stellman, who wrote a book called Dual Citizens, Life and Worship Between the Already and the Not Yet, he puts it this way. God's delay in ushering in the kingdom in its glorious and final form means that we live in the intersection of the present and the future as exiles and pilgrims. And this reality shapes our identity at every turn. Now, there are tensions inherent with living in this gap, in living in the overlap of the ages. I want to look at two of them specifically this morning. The first one is the fact that as Christians, we are temporary residents on earth, but our citizenship is in heaven. Temporary residents on earth, but citizens of heaven. Peter writes, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. We are temporary residents on earth. And Paul writes, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. When I went away to college, I moved some 500 miles away from home away from everything I knew, everyone I knew, all the people who knew me, and I became a temporary resident of Indiana. I got a student ID with my picture and my name and my student ID number on it. This little card gave me access to various locations around campus. I also got discounts from local stores and restaurants. But my official identification My driver's license was still from the state of New York. In Indiana, I had a mailbox and a shared living space. In New York, I had a home and a room of my own. I still lived in the same country, but there were some differences I encountered between the two locations, some more comical than others. Many of them ironically had to do with vocabulary or the apparent accent that I had when I moved here. I remember one instance in particular. A couple of college friends and I were going grocery shopping one day, and as we walked into Meyer, I asked, do we need a carriage? They looked at me like I was green, so I repeated myself. I assumed they did not hear me correctly. I didn't know how many items were on our list, how much we needed to buy, so I asked, do we need a carriage or a basket. Apparently, you call those things shopping carts, which I must admit is a very clear name for them, and you've reserved the word carriage for a transportation device pulled by horses. That is not the case on the East Coast. It was a silly miscommunication, but it reminded me that I wasn't home. As Christians, and temporary residents here, we are not home. We are just residents of this earth, but citizens of heaven. And the real conflict lies in the fact that the, those two kingdoms, heaven and earth, are not compatible. So what does living in this tension really mean for us? What does it mean for our day-to-day lives? I think what we're really talking about here is a worldview, about how we view the world around us, how we conduct ourselves, where our loyalties lie. Because our citizenship is in heaven, the way we view the world around us is different. It has to be different because it is informed by the word of God. And I say this to myself as as I say it to you, do not be fooled that, that this is easy. 
Don't be fooled into thinking that this is second nature at this point because the kingdom of heaven, nearly everything is backwards in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever takes the lowly position of a child, they are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Earthly wealth and possession makes it nearly impossible to get into the kingdom. The Son of God himself came not to be served, but to serve. Our concept of fairness, the way we understand it, is completely backwards. According to the kingdom of God, the first shall be last. Have you ever witnessed a group of elementary school students trying to get into a line to go somewhere? It is human nature to want to be first and to push and shove to get there. The things that are considered great in our earthly kingdom, in our understanding, wealth, power, authority, status, influence, they do not translate into the greatness of the kingdom. Lowly, poor, humble, servanthood, persecuted. Being a temporary resident means we live differently. This is not our home. At the same time, a temporary resident is different than a tourist. You see, the goal of a tourist trip or a vacation is to get the most bang for your buck, to experience as much as you can, to enjoy and to taste and to just be there for a few days. But we're not just passing through. Even though our time here is quite limited, as temporary residents, we have our eyes set on our final destination and therefore we live more purposefully than we would if we were just tourists passing through. But that's our first tension. We are temporary residents of this earth and yet our citizenship is in heaven. The second tension is the fact that we, as Christians, are adopted children, but we are waiting for full rights of adoption. Romans 8.15 tells us this, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now you may be thinking, isn't everyone a child of God? The Bible tells us no. Everyone, every human being was designed by him, was made in his image, and is loved by him. But in order to become children of God, we have to be adopted by him. John 1.12 tells us, But to all who believed him, meaning Jesus, and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. And as adopted children, we now have a special relationship with each member of the Trinity. With all three members, we have this special connection. Here's how Paul describes those relationships. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. And a few verses later, he adds, we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. You know, the one word that pops into my mind when I read that is love. The fact that we are children of God, that he has chosen to adopt us, it's just love. Hang on to that today. Don't just breeze right past that. God loves you and has chosen to adopt you as his child. We get to call God Father. We are co-heirs with Christ and sharers of his joy and his suffering. And we have the Holy Spirit as a foretaste of future glory. A foretaste is like that first bite of mom's meal before it hits the table while it's still piping hot and you are that unofficial taste tester. That was my job title um, in the home I grew up in. And if I'm being honest, when we visit my parents, that's still the role I choose to take as an official taste tester. A foretaste is like the nibble of cookie dough before the freshly baked cookies. It is good, 
perfect even, in its current form. It's just not fully satisfying because it's not all that it is going to be. We have the Holy Spirit as a foretaste of future glory. So we are adopted children if we believe in Jesus and accept his free offer of salvation. And therefore, we have this special connection with each member of the Trinity. And yet, Paul tells us we wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children. Now, adopted children have the same rights as biological children. So what are we waiting for? What are those full rights? Paul gives us two specifics. First, the new bodies that God promised us. That's one of the things we're waiting for. And second, being released from sin and suffering. Essentially, we have been saved, yet we are waiting for ultimate salvation, for that future glory that is to come when sin and suffering are no more, when they have no hold over us. The words of Romans, inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by Paul, are better than any I could write. So I just want to read them to you this morning. Romans 8, beginning at verse 18. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse but with eager hope that creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan. Even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too Wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Creation groans while it waits for Jesus' return, while it waits to be made new again. Is it just me or does it seem like creation was groaning just a little bit more loudly this past year? And we as Christians groan. Why? Because we're living in this tension. Because we know that inherently somehow we know that this is just not the way that it was intended to be. That there's more to come. That this already not yet thing is hard. We groan in in this waiting. Human beings just don't like tension. We don't enjoy living in conflict it's why cliffhangers work if you've ever watched a tv show the writers know that if they leave you intentionally hanging from week to week you will continue to watch because you have to know how it ends did they survive what's going to happen is this problem going to be solved it's how binge watching became a thing because if the next episode is available for you, you just let it play because you need that resolution. There's a word for that resolution. We've borrowed it from the French. I'm going to take you back real briefly here to English class in high school when you learned like onomatopoeia and all the details of a story. Denouement literally means to untie the knot. It's the point of a story where the conflict is resolved. And the purpose of the denouement is to actually determine how the reader will feel when they close the book or how the viewer will feel when they leave the theater. The denouement tells them how they're supposed to feel. And when it is missing or it's not well written, we're left unsatisfied. Are you unsatisfied with your present circumstances right now? Do you look around and wonder, what in the world is going on? Are you tired, just tired of the waiting? As Christians living in the already 
not yet, as temporary residents, as adopted children waiting for future glory, this tension is to be expected. But it doesn't make for an easy sermon. I got to tell you, this is not one we like to preach. We as pastors, we want to look at a problem and then point to a solution. But our present reality means that we have to learn to live in this tension. There are, however, a few things I can offer you this morning. What are we to do in the waiting? One of the phrases I repeated uh, this morning, I I didn't draw attention to it, but it's something that was read in in Philippians 3.20 and then throughout Romans 8, this little phrase, eager hope. What does it mean to eagerly hope? How do we do it? Paul says, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something that we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Uh, If I'm being honest with you, neither one of these are easy for me, patiently and confidently. Um, It has been well documented by my parents and certainly by my husband that I do not like to wait patiently, that I'm... I'm not a very patient individual. And if I dig a little deeper and am really honest with you, there are times where I have asked myself, what if we're wrong? What if I have devoted my entire life to something that I have woefully misunderstood? What if we as Christians, what if we're wrong? That's pretty far from waiting confidently. But the Bible tells me that I am an adopted child of God, that I'm a co-heir with Christ, but you know what? Some days it does not feel like it. And I can read that my citizenship is in heaven, but I've never been there. This is hard. We, We don't like this tension. We don't understand it. Hebrews 11.1, 1, the first verse of the chapter that has been deemed the Faith Hall of Fame. Here's what it says. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And I got to tell you, I'm one of those who likes to see in order to believe. I would have been with Thomas. Let me see the scars in your hands, Jesus. And then 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope, be intentional, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Hope, faith. That is what we are left with in this tension between the already and the not yet. And there is deep faith and spiritual maturity available for us when we learn to live well in this tension. And there is final resolution that I can at least point to this morning. Revelation 11:15 says then the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. We do know the ending. We have not been forgotten. Jesus is coming back. This is not our final home. There is life after death. There is hope in the waiting. So live this life. Enjoy this life and this earth, but do it because you know who made it, you know who gave it to you, all the while remembering that there is so much better yet to come. eagerly hope, expectantly wait, learn to live well in the tension of the already and the not yet. And let our prayer in the in-between be as Jesus taught, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to close this morning by first praying with anyone who this message prompted you, the Holy Spirit prompted you into wondering, do I know that my citizenship is in heaven? Do I know where I'm going? 
can I have this eager hope? If you're not sure this morning, I'd like to just lead you in a very simple prayer. Jesus, thank you for your your free gift of salvation. I recognize that I need you, and I ask for your forgiveness. I want to become an adopted child of God. Thank you, Jesus. It truly is that simple of a beginning. Jesus offers us that that hope, that confidence that we can rest assured in. Let me close by praying for the for the remainder of us. Heavenly Father, this is hard. We don't like to live in tension. We don't like conflict. We want resolution, and, and yet here we are. Lord, at the same time, we, we recognize this morning that your Holy Spirit has been given to us. You didn't leave us alone in this tension. The, the Spirit is a foretaste of that future glory that we cannot wait for, Lord. I ask that as we go about the rest of our day that you would go with us, that you would remind us that we have hope, that we have the ability to to exercise faith in you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for who you are. My goodness, Lord, thank you for not leaving us alone in this tension. Amen. Now may the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you as you go. You are sent.